So yeah, thank you for coming everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about Accelerate Haskell. Um, my name is Joe Nash, and I'm a developer advocate at Braintree. Uh, we're one of the sponsors of the conference. Um, not for any particular reason, I'm not recruiting or trying to sell anything. I just really like functional programming. Um, if you haven't heard of Braintree, just a beautifully good tree sponsorship uh, We're a payment processor, we help you make money. Um, and some of our clients are pretty cool. We have Airfu, Airbnb, Mojang, you make Minecraft. If you are interested in the payments industry or any of the related topics about security and that sort of thing, I'm happy to talk about it, but this talk is going to be down straight for the second. Um, so this is actually my first time to Boulder or anywhere in America outside of New York and San Fran. Um, I'm from the UK, so with these mountains are spectacular. I'm used to hills that look a bit like this, so have tubby tubbies usually on them. Um, so this is a fantastic place to be, and I just want to thank you all for welcoming me here. It's really awesome. Um, in particular, I'm from a place called Essex. As you may already have noticed, I speak quite fast. Essex, if you don't know, is uh, the English equivalent of Jersey Shore. We have Towie, the only way is Essex. I have to speak fast to survive. But this is a small group, so if I do speak too fast, just interrupt me. If you want me to go back over something, just let me know. I'll go back over it, probably in the exact same accent and speed, but we'll try and make it work. Um, so I'm going to do this quite a light session, because as someone pointed out on Twitter yesterday, this track is hella intense. And if you've been here all day, I imagine you're starting to be quite tired. Um, I'm also really jet lagged. So we're going to be, we're not going to go into too much depth. I'm not going to whack you over the head with a 400 line Mandel Bros set generator or anything like that. Um, but if you do want to go into more depth, we've got the unconference session tomorrow and also around your day. Um, I hope we've got a workshop tomorrow now so you can hang me in there. Um, so yeah, why are we here? We're here to talk about GP, GPU which is a ridiculous mouthful and leads you to thinking like this immediately. Um, and that, what that basically stands for is general purpose computing on graphical processing units. Um, you can simplify this. So I tend to just say that great programs gain performance upgrades um, because you write them in a very nice way and you manage to exploit some new resources that we don't usually use. Um, and we're talking about that in the frame of Haskell. Um, so I know this is a very mixed conference. I want to kind of get filled the room, so I hope your arms aren't tired. Um, who is a Haskell here? I would assume it's probably all of you. Fantastic. Has anyone got any experience with general purpose GPU programming here? Wonderful. You two probably know more than I do. Um, yeah. Going oh, wait, Chris? Yeah. Congratulations on the book release. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and then going further, has anyone done any GPU GPU in Haskell already? Okay, cool. So you're my wingman. If I say anything stupid, you've got to call it out, right? Right. <laughs> so GPU. Using the graphic processing unit for more than just graphics. Why would we do something like that? We would do that because Moore's Law is failing, or depending how controversial we're feeling, has already failed. Moore's Law, basically, for anyone who doesn't know, was that the idea that transistors on a chip will double every two years. By Intel's estimates, their chip efficiency now, or their transistor efficiency nowadays, is more than 90,000 times, and their cost is 60,000 times less today than what it was in 1971. So just think about that a minute. That's a single transistor being 90,000 times more efficient than it was in 1971. Apply that to a car. <laughs> <laughs> that is a ludicrous call. And apply, that, apply the cost to planes. <laughs> this is an insane figure. And that's not even the whole chip. We're talking about a single transistor on a chip which has billions of these things. It's just an insane speed improvement. So the fact that this exponential gain has completely fallen over is a big issue and is throwing a lot of people. Currently we're down to 14 nanometers. It's harder to get much smaller because you start to get massive heat things, the cost, the uh, decrease in the cost, which is also part of the Moore's Law, it's not just the performance increase, it also predicts a decrease in cost and the economic factor starts to, you start to lose that. It starts to become less and less worth it to make the smaller uh, transistors. And when you think back to say five years ago, when you went from, when you upgraded from device, so I had a HTC Hero in 2011, can tell it's 2011 because HTC was still relevant. Um, but about then I had HTC Hero. When I upgraded the next year to a Desire, that was like mind-blowing speed upgrade. It was it was feelable. You could notice it. Oh, did I get played it? Whereas oh, I've ruined my gift now. <laughs> Whereas nowadays, when you upgrade from one phone to another or from one system to another, you just kind of get that. Yeah. You get new features. You get new designs. You get new software. But you don't really get the notice of speed improvement. Typically, the biggest speed improvement you can get now is when you're actually changing mediums. For example, the only really noticeable speed improvement you can get in a laptop nowadays, unless you're still using something from 1928, is when you go from a hard drive to a solid state drive. That's when you're going from a physical spinning disk of metal to transistors. From transistor to transistor, you don't tend to get the wow moment now. 
So we're talking about an incremental versus exponential increase. We're starting to get towards the incremental. And this is a big problem because, as someone, there's been many jokes made about this, um, that although, and you'll probably sympathize, um, that although our computers have gotten exponentially faster, they don't feel faster. A machine from 1995 probably feels the same as your Windows 10. If you're using Windows, I feel sorry for you anyway. Um, <laughs> but the fact is that users' computing is getting more advanced, their needs for computing is getting more advanced and growing more dependent, so we're making bigger software. And that's taking up the resources that we're generating. So if we start generating less resources, the, that increase in the needs for resources isn't going to stop. And that leaves us with only a couple of things to do. How do we get the resources we need to continue with this growing use of computers? Well, the first solution is we can all go back to basics and dump all of our abstractions and go back to assembly and start crawling around like worms in the mud trying to suck every last bit of nutrients out. I'm personally not into that. <laughs> I don't think many people in this room are into that. You're a functional programming conference. You're obsessed with abstractions. The other option is to go big, to build more data centers, to start offloading local computations to the cloud and doing them in bigger machines in bigger places. This, quite frankly, is destroying the planet. Quite a lot of uh, big manufacturers, Google, etc., are really responsible, are trying to be really responsible with their database design, uh, computing center designs. Facebook open sourced their efficient data center design and is trying to push that forward as a standard to save energy, to save water, etc. But it's not going far enough, and if we keep going this way, the world soon will look like that. <laughs> so we have another solution. On our devices now, we have a lot of unused resources. One of them, I'm really behind the slides. <laughs> One of them is specialist processors. So every device now has a wide variety of processors. GPUs are one of them. We call these heterogeneous systems. So these are devices, these are systems that are using more than one type of, uh, more than one type of processing chip. The definition of Wikipedia is typically what you should expect. Um, but you can gain, as it says there, the important bit, you can gain performance not what, by adding the same type of processes, but by exploiting the specialities in the different ones. And GPUs are optimized for a task, and that task is obviously video and graphics processing. But we can, I think I made up a word here, I don't know if that's a real word, we can genericize this task. We can use that, we can take what's special about that task and apply it in other places. And then you can identify that in your general computation. So what's special about the computations that graphics processors do is that they're single instruction, multiple data. We're talking about uh, like what graphics processors are optimized to do is take a large set of data and apply a single instruction to it over and over again. This is a type of parallelism called data parallelism. We're talking about having huge data structures and being able to apply an operation to every element of that data structure all at the same time. And that's possible because GPUs have hundreds of cores optimized to do this. If we talk about one of the architectures uh, in NVIDIA's Tegra, um, they have 192 cores in this architecture. That is an insane amount. If you're talking about like CPUs where you've got like eight cores, yes, you can do more than one operation per time on the map, for example. Um, but this is an insane increase in the amount of resources we're able to use for this task. And you do that in parallel, which is another one of the really important things. We're not really exploiting the number of processes we have. Increasing the number of processes is one of our only options, and we're not really using it. And that's because it's hard, quite frankly. If you think about um, going back to low level abstractions, if you think about in the 80s or 90s when we were all using C in assembly. Doing stuff with low-level memory was dangerous, so we built abstractions to stop doing it. When you talk about concurrency and parallelism, there are things that are managing the memory across multiple processors and across these data stores that we're doing, and we don't have the abstractions to make them safe, to make them not dangerous, and it's a lot of hard work. So there is some reasons why we haven't been able to exploit this properly. But if you're sitting there thinking that this sounds doable now, and that you recognize what this might be, it should do, because, of course, this is the map. We're taking a data structure, and we're doing one operation across every element of that data structure. So why aren't we already exploiting this in our program? I say it's quite hard, but in the typical, in the actual use case of graphics, it's because there's been no support for it. Up until about 2001, it wasn't actually possible to do this at all. And then after 2001, you could, but you had to reformat your code into using the graphical primitives, which no one really wants to do, because that's a horrible thing. But then someone made CUDA and OpenCL. So these are actually two different kind of competing standards. CUDA is proprietary, made by NVIDIA. OpenCL is an open source solution. It has a uh, driving committee, etc. Um, 
and they expose APIs and they expose the primitive operations and they expose the primitive data types so that we can start exploiting GPUs for general purpose programming. Um, but unfortunately, they think C, C++, and Fortran at high level. I'm not even joking here. The NVIDIA documentation for this says we don't want to do anything that like, goes to talk about low level and then it says so we've got high level languages and then list these through. <laughs> that is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Again, I want no part of that. <laughs> so as I feel we love abstractions, and as Haskellers especially, we love DSLs. Haskellers love a good domain specific language. Everything we do has to be its own language because we're special. And in particular, Accelerate loves is an, is an embedded domain specific language. So, onto the meat of it. Accelerate. This was made by, uh, from, it started off being made by the team down in the uh, University of New South Wales. We've actually just had YAL, their conference, very similar to this. Um, really talented team, Manuel Chuck of Archery. Um, they do some incredible stuff. Um, and Accelerate is one of theirs, and it's an array computing language. So all of the data types that we use are arrays, and we work over arrays. So just a quick preamble, obviously you probably all know how to go and get household packages. This is no different. You go to Kabal and then swear for four hours as you can fight through dependencies. Um, actually, Accelerate tends not to be too bad. Um, I think it's also in stack -age. Um And what Accelerate is, is it takes Haskell and it generates CUDA for you. Um, they do have other backends. So there is an OpenCL backend, there is an LLVM backend. Um, they're working on some crazy ones. I think someone made like some insane prototype bash backend for some reason. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, for testing purposes, obviously, if you, have a, if you want to play with this and you don't have a GPU, or you just don't want to have to offload something for a GPU all the time, um, they also have an interpreter. Um, obviously, you don't get the speed gain, so if you just want to experiment with it, if you're doing this now while we're talking, that's when you want to use it. So once you've installed it, typically just firing it up, you just import as normal. We're doing qualified imports here because, um, as I've already hinted at with the map, some of the operations available on accelerate arrays do clash with the preview. Um, as I said, all computations are arrays. So arrays and accelerate are a bit different from what you might expect. They have two constructors for a start. Um, those constructors are a bit weird. Uh, I'll go into why in a minute. Um, but the array type is based on shapes and elements. So when we think of shapes, we're talking dimensions. So if you're thinking of arrays, you might think a two-dimensional array. We have one array nested in another. Very similar, except we can't nest arrays computer. We have this special array constructor which tells an octopus, so um, in Accelerate, we have this special uh, shape constructor which tells our arrays, uh, tells Accelerate how to deal with the indices of the arrays. And then elements, again, because we're working on GPUs, there are some restrictions on what we can use. GPUs are only optimized for some kinds of computations, so we can have various widths of ints, floats, and tuples. One important thing to mention here is when using CUDA, it's fairly standardized across all the NVIDIA chips, you're gonna get similar performance. If you use the OpenCL backend, OpenCL is available on a much wider range of graphics processors. It's like it's much more widely applicable. But because of that, they're not able to deal with device by device optimization. Some graphics processing units work better at different inputs, for example, than others. They just perform better. So if you're if you happen to use the OpenCL backend um, and you're seeing that you're not getting the performance upgrade you'd expect, it's worth going and checking the data types, because something as simple as that makes a huge difference. So when we get to the instructor for array, you can see we've got, as I said, we've got this shape argument and the element argument. And when we actually want to construct the shape, we start to get into the weirdness. So uh, this is our first constructor. So shapes have two constructors. This is a zero one. This indicates a uh, array with no dimensions. So this is a scalar, it just has one element. When we get to our next one, we want to start building multiple dimensional arrays. As a typical Haskeller, we make up a random infix symbol. Um, I haven't thought of a witty name for this yet. If anyone has one, please shout it out. Um, but we use this. Um, and this is the weird, as I've mentioned. These, these constructors are both type and value constructors. So this can get a bit confusing when you're reading the docs and you're like, wait a minute, that, what, what, why is that there? Um, but it's also quite handy in that you know exactly what the symbol you're using should be doing each time. So, it's a covered no dimensions scalar. Um, so this is, if we wanted to create a one dimensional thing, just use Z. If you want to build up a one dimensional one, we, we have a funny symbol, Z and an int. So this is one dimension, and one dimensional array indexed by int. 
We can actually only index by int, so making it explicit has always seemed kind of silly to me. Um, but it makes more sense because that constructor is, of course, a value as well, and we need to index by, we need to use that later to signify the length of that dimension. Um, so this, yeah, so this one, we could name that a vector. So if we want to build up dimensions, we just add more dimensions on. So we're then indexing the next one by name. So an important thing to note here is that this is left associative. Um, this part is also on the left, and this part will be here. Um, that becomes important later when you talk about the order the dimensions are applied. So this is obviously a two-dimensional we call this a matrix. Um, but if you're thinking like right now that building complex arrays and complex data structures out of these is going to be a bit painful, luckily some helpful type synonyms are provided. We've got the dimension scale on the left, and on the right we have scalar and vector uh, synonyms. Um, of course, you can define as many of these as you want. So, when we're playing with the interpreter, uh, we typically aren't really using the Accelerate DSL. Accelerate provides <coughs> some operations for us to let us make uh, these arrays from list, uh, from data structures more familiar, familiar with, such as lists. We have the from list operation. Um, you have to put the type there, otherwise you get horrible errors. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, this is a value construct as well, so you have it popping up in this parameter. So this is what the uh, result of that will be. We have an array, and we have a dimension of uh, one dimension of ten, and then obviously we have the elements of that array. So if, we're, if we were to do this for two dimensional, so if we were to add an extra dimension here, what would happen? I should have put some slides where it's going to be confusing. What we would get would be a grid. Yeah, so if we were to do, for example, z, funny symbol, 3, and then 5, this would create a multi-dimensional array, but it does it from the right. So in a two-dimensional array, you've got your x and your y dimensions, obviously. The 5, the rightmost one, would be our x, and then the inner one would be our y. That's not very intuitive, um, but that's just how it deals with it. But what you get out of it, um, so in this form, the resulting data structure wouldn't reflect that. It doesn't create a nested list or anything like that. What Accelerate does in the back end is that this constructor tells Accelerate how to deal with the indices and how to treat those. It doesn't actually reflect that dimensionality in the data structure. So as I said, this isn't really taking place in Accelerate DSL. To do that and to actually start generating code, we need to use run. So run takes some arrays. Or ra run, sorry, it's use I'm thinking of. Uh, run acts in the context of Accelerate. And also it's taking some, data, uh, some array and result going to another array. So if we have an array and we want to pull it into the Accelerate context, we have to use use. So this is a simplified data type of use. We're going to the full one in a bit. Um, but that just does as you expect. You have some arrays, and it puts them into the Accelerate context. So if we look at familiar operation and how that works, for example, map, we have here some slightly unfamiliar type classes at the top. So shape, we've spoken about. ELT, this is an element. Obviously, you're going to have arrays and you're going to have elements. So one of the things that Accelerate does really well is to make sure that your code stays data parallelizable, so that it stays in a flat structure where you've got multiple pieces of data that the same operation can be applied to. If you were able to nest arrays, for example, or you were able to have an element that was an array, you would break that property. So element, the things that go inside the arrays, are slightly different to how arrays are treated. We then also have expression. This, these are operations that act on an individual data element of the array instead of the array itself. So when we talk about Accelerate, these are, this is the context in which uh, operations run on the an array, and then exp, uh, exp, that's running on an individual element. So when we use map, we have an array, which we've defined before, using probably from list or some other constructor. We use use on it to bring it into Accelerate. We're performing our map operation across that, and then we're running the whole thing. So that will go off, and that will produce the uh, accelerate, whatever, whatever accelerate option, whatever backend you're using. So run is actually exported by all the backends. It's exported by the interpreter. It's exported by CUDA. It's exported by OpenCL. And that will go off and produce what you'd expect. And then we get our result. So I've kind of covered ELT. So this is the more complete type for use. As you see here, this is actually making the use of ELT explicit. So ELT, 
uh, the element obviously has to be the second part of the array because that's what we'd expect. But by doing, by doing that, we stop ourselves putting arrays into our elements and stop us doing multiple dimensions. And same with ESP. So as I mentioned, array is a computational array, and EXP is a computational element. So if we want to produce a unit, for example. So I'm going to close this door. I keep kicking. We have so we're just a unit of computation. We'd have one element. We're applying computation to it, and then putting that into an accelerate context and wrapping that in a scalar array. So that's an array of just Z and an array of no dimensions. So so far, I've only really showed you how to create arrays kind of from, with, from list constructors and then pulling them in using use. But obviously, that's a bit cumbersome, and we can create arrays actually inside the ACC directly. There's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, I'm only going to show you the simplest one. Oh, hello. Just press the screen. I'm only going to show you the simplest one, um, and that is fill. So with fill, um, well basically, as it says, it's filling an array up from some constructing data. So we have an operation that takes place over a shape. We have an operation that takes place over an uh, element. And then we're moving that uh, resulting array into a Accelerate. So how you typically do this with the fill is that would be, for example, um, the value constructor applied to something. So it would be a Z applied to your dimensionality. Or you could do that dynamically using some other clever uh, code. And then you want your. Uh, Operation that generates the elements, and then we just wrap that and accelerate. So we can see this in dot product. Don't actually think I have fill on here. Apparently, I don't show you how to use fill. I just go straight into it. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, happy to go through that and the more complex ones later. Um, so yeah, this is dot product. Um, very simple operation. This is one of the most simple operations you'd want to perform on a GPU. Um, here, we're just taking two vectors um, and whacking them into the accelerate context. You can see we do that with these two users here. So this is kind of using that external DSL rather than the internal one, as we did earlier. We just take our two vectors, apply use to both of them, and then we can use fold. So the operations you have on your arrays are very similar to the operations you'd expect to have in lists. So you have folds, you have zips, you have map. Um, and then once we're doing things like this, we can offload to the GPU. So I think that got to about 25 minutes. As I said, this is very light, much shorter than I intended to be. And we've barely scratched the surface of what this library does. Um, every time I use it, I get bitten in the face by some new functionality I didn't realize was there. It's a very deep and huge API. Um, it's also very similar to Repr, which is another, uh, another array computation library. Um, again, it's a DSL made. It's, the API is basically identical, um, but this is more applicable to things you do on your CPU. Um, some really great resources for learning more about this. Um, Anything by Simon Marlow. Simon Marlow wrote a fantastic book. Um, it's in, there's a chapter on this in uh, Parallel and Distributed Programming in Haskell. Um, he also did a talk on it. Um, and then there's been more recent talks. There was one at, uh, I think it was, I can't remember where it was. There was a, there's a couple on YouTube from a couple of conferences. Um, so yeah, sorry that came in some under time. Um, if you want to come grab me and talk to me about anything, I've been Joe Nash. Thank you very much. <laughs>